This afternoon is a celebration of scholarship, of learning, of creativity, and of what it takes to do a dissertation, which in Yiddish is called Zitzvash, which is the capacity to sit and to study. Uh, now, let me say why we are holding it. It's not every dissertation that we celebrate, though there is a um, wonderful blessing that is misused in Judaism. And uh, this rabbi talking is going to tell you about the blessing being misused in Judaism. When a child is bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, you normally say, Baruch Shem Tarani Mion Shem Shazet. Blessed be he who has freed me of this punishment or responsibility. And the truth is that your, your responsibilities are only beginning. <laughs> that you have ahead of you high school, you have ahead of you college, you have ahead of you a whole range of things until they bring grandchildren into your world, and then it's worth everything you've done for your children. I have never met anyone who is not willing to say at the end of their dissertation, blessed be he who has freed me of this punishment. <laughs> And it's a blessing that we have um, a number of times, but um, if it was Mark's punishment, it's our celebration. Let me talk for three seconds about what I mean by that. Now, what's the importance for historians, and this is the importance of this dissertation and this study? The importance for historians is that the Yiddish historians were closer to the victims than anyone else. They spoke the language for the most part, they experienced the events, and they were very close to the events, and they wrote of the events to an audience that they understood was interested not only in what the Germans did to the Jews, but how the Jews lived and responded, reacted and engaged in the elements there. So it is the language that is closer to a combination of two things that we use in history, Jewish agency, which means the, not the Jewish agency, the, the institution, but Jewish agency, which means the actions of the Jews, and also what they were desperately seeking, and this began in the Shoah, they were desperately seeking not a history of what was done to the Jews, but a Jewish history. And the Jewish history is not only what happened to the Jews, but how the Jews responded, reacted, and the like. And along comes this work and makes it accessible to a generation that may not have the linguistic skills to experience this history in the language in which it was written. But they have the skills to understand how one can write of this and bring us much closer to the Jewish experience. That's why we're holding this event. That's why Mark is going to have his book published, and some of you have asked where you get it. By the way, it's a hefty work. The hefty work is um, 400 and, um, 536 pages. So it's a weighty work in the most literal sense of the term weighty. But we have to be grateful to Mark for doing it. And then we have to also see that this is going to be an anchor work of people who want to understand who was closest to the event. So I think congratulations on the word to Mark. And I think congratulations on the order to the field for having this gift. I'm now going to have Mary introduce Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Birnbaum. <clears throat> um, the, we thank uh, the American Jewish University for collaborating with us on this wonderful event. We have a long history of collaboration with AJU. Uh, the Art of Yiddish, some of you may remember, was held here for quite a few years. And of course, I personally have a long history of teaching Yiddish here uh, with great uh, joy and out of it having some dear friends uh, to this very day. So uh, I have a lot of, lots of appreciation for AJU. Uh, 
I also uh, want to thank the staff of Lauren Jacobs who helped arrange this event. Uh, and, of course, our wonderful British Institute board members who always volunteer their time. So Joyce Tamara, who was at the table, and uh, Sylvia Wagensberg, who's filming this event. Cycle, the Yiddish Institute, really rarely does programs on the Holocaust. For the simple reason that by championing Yiddish, we want to broaden the experience of our Jewish heritage to, to be beyond religion, beyond the Holocaust, and Israel. The exception, as some of you know, <clears throat> has been programs focused on courage and creativity, otherwise known as spiritual resistance related to Holocaust, in particular, as expressed through the lens of Yiddish language and culture, which is why we're here today. I've known Mark for over 20 years. We've been part of the same Leyenkreis, a reading circle, out of which have come some remarkable endeavors. You all know Yiddish Chai LA, the California Yiddish Institute, and now a newly minted PhD on Yiddish historians. Early on, when the rest of us in the Leyenkreis were confining our reading of Yiddish literature to our bi-monthly meetings, Mark was already digging into major works in Yiddish on his own. And this is how, as I understand it, he came across the subject matter he will speak about today. And this awakening to an entire body of richly written and sourced material in Yiddish is what eventually led to his pursuing his doctorate in history at UCLA. What is remarkable about this is that he was already at the helm of a thriving, i.e. demanding, architectural practice. Mark Smith is one of those highly unusual people who arrive at a fork in the road and decide to take both of them at once. <laughs> I think the only way he could have done this, aside from having prodigious mental faculties, is by not sleeping. It took tremendous courage by the Jewish historians who will be mentioned today to be the first to sift through the ashes of their demolished civilization in Europe, like family members faced with the aftermath of an inferno that destroyed all of their extended family and their inheritance, it would have been easier, in my view, to look away. Or at least to wait some years for the shock and pain to diminish. But they did not wait, and we now have Mark to thank for revealing to us exactly how these individuals sought in their own mamaloshin to illuminate and to struggle to comprehend a cataclysm which is inherently an impenetrable darkness and on so many levels incomprehensible. Now for some details historic and otherwise about our speaker. Dr. Smith began his academic work as a region scholar at UC Berkeley and UCLA, receiving his BA in History of Architecture, summa cum laude, and as a member of Phi Beta Kappa. His master's degree in architecture is from UCLA, and it came with a Dean's Award for Best Research Thesis. Mark's award-winning practice of architecture and engineering here in Los Angeles has been ongoing for more than 30 years. Due to Mark's continuing interest in Jewish history, he returned to UCLA for further studies, as I mentioned. He has published articles and delivered papers at academic conferences on topics on Jewish studies, always with a special emphasis 
on Yiddish language and culture. In March of this year, as Dr. Birabal mentioned, truly in record time, given his full-time architectural work, Mark received his PhD in Jewish history at UCLA. His dissertation, which you saw waved around, is entitled The Yiddish Historians and the Struggle for a Jewish History of the Holocaust. And in December, he'll be speaking at the annual conference of the Association for Jewish Studies on the subject Holocaust Research in Yiddish as a Study in Jewish Continuity. And once you've caught up on your sleep, Mark, we're, we're going to wait for that book, right? <laughs> An edited version of the dissertation. So it is my great honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Smith. Thank you very much, Michael and Miriam both. I moved on your introduction. I'm grateful. Lift up the mic. I should have begun by asking Ken the last row here. <laughs> is this all right? Yes. Yes? yes. And if I look down, is it still all right? Yes. All right, fine. Thank you very, very much for your kind introductions. I, I appreciate them, particularly considering the sources, and I hope to do the subject honor. Miriam mentioned the land cries that we have belonged to for many years, and I should say that many, many years ago, before that land cries reading circle began, when I was still a graduate student in architecture, I was asked to write a review by the editor of the local architectural publication, LA Architect, a review of the newly constructed Martyrs Memorial that was at that time built on the top floor of the Jewish Federation building. It had been designed by a survivor, an architect by the name of Benno Fischer from Poland, and this editor asked if I would write the review of it as an architectural work and with some knowledge of the field. And so I did, and it was, in fact, a very fine work, and I was able to write a very favorable and, and uh, comprehensive review of it. When I gave it to the architect to comment in case there was any error, he said, let me get back to you in a couple of days. My English is not very good, and I want to give it to someone to read it for me. And he did, and he came back and he said, yes, this is just wonderful, thank you, and that was the end of that. About 25 years later, I was chatting with the late Fima Chesnin, one of the leaders and founders of our Yiddish Reading Circle, who was a longtime board member of the LA Museum of the Holocaust, and he was talking to me about things that they did there and talked about and so on. He mentioned his old friend, Benno Fisher. And I said, oh, well, I said, I remember Benno. I wrote this article one time long ago about his design for the Martyrs Memorial. And Fema said to me, oh, yes, I remember it very well. It was a fine article. And I said, you do? He said, yes, uh, Benno gave it to me to read, <laughs> to comment. So it is a very small world, and one that intersects, and if you're fortunate, well, as they say, a belt with belt with, and if you're fortunate in your life, they can intersect in positive ways, and I'm grateful they have in mind. As Miriam said, our land cries focused, focuses primarily on literature, the great Yiddish literature, but my own reading, for whatever reasons of my own, veered off into nonfiction, into the field of Jewish history. And I simply found that the writers who spoke most directly to me were the historians who wrote Jewish history in Yiddish. I called them the Yiddish historians. I am not aware that anyone has actually called them this before. They are the historians who worked to a significant degree in Yiddish. Now, there is no historian who wrote only in Yiddish. And all of them can be talked about in ways that 
connect them to Russian Jewish history or Polish Jewish history or American or Israeli Jewish history. But I saw them through the lens of their writing in Yiddish. The, the high period of writing Jewish history in Yiddish was between the two world wars in Eastern Europe, where there was a very large, and as you know, thriving community of Yiddish speakers. There was also an intellectual movement that wanted to have the full intellectual life of the Jewish people in Europe exist in Yiddish, in the language of the people. This was not to turn away from Hebrew, but rather, in their view, Hebrew had an uncertain future in the early 1920s, 30s. No one imagined that it would really become the majority language of a Jewish state. And Yiddish historians were certain that people would continue to read in Yiddish and that the vast majority of Jews in Europe would continue to speak Yiddish. And so they wrote in the language they thought to be the language of their people. There were three major centers of Yiddish scholarship, the US, Poland, Soviet Union. And these historians who worked in those spheres published primarily in the journals of the organization known as YIVO, the Yiddish Wissenschaftlicher Institute, the Jewish Scientific Institute, which was headquartered in Vilna before the war and in New York after the war. These were scholars who could not attain positions in universities because even though they had fine educations, universities in Poland and other Eastern European countries simply did not provide professorships to Jews to teach Jewish history. There was one in Poland. Meyer Galaban held that important position at the University of Warsaw and he was apparently considered sufficient. The result was that Ivo served as what I would call a shadow university. It provided the place for graduate level education and teaching. And these historians taught there, wrote there, did their research, created an archive and a library and collection, and they published in the journal of that organization called Yivo Blether, the, the pages, literally, of Yivo. The characteristics of their work were different from other historians. First of all, they viewed Jewish history in positive light. They were not interested in writing the history of anti-Semitism or of Jewish rights and disabilities in various countries. They wanted to write the history of the Jews. And they did this long before Salo Baron, the famous Jewish historian, articulated his his call for writing Jewish history in what he called the anti-lacrimose mode, the, the mode without tears. These Yiddish historians before World War II had their own range of topics. They wrote the internal history of the Jews of Eastern Europe from medieval to modern times. They wrote social and economic history. They wrote about communal autonomy, Yiddish theater, press, and literature, Jewish guilds and occupations, Haskalah, that is to say the Jewish Enlightenment and Hasidism, legal, medical, and educational systems, and they also wrote about Jewish art, architecture, antiquities, urban quarters, clothing, and foods. In other words, they wrote about Jewish life. As it happens, however, there were not a lot of archives to draw upon. As a stateless people, the Jews had no archives. And so they, and YIVO as an organization, appealed to the Jewish public to bring in materials. They had people who were called zamers, collectors, who went to their towns, their archives, their record books, whatever could be found throughout Eastern Europe, and sent in copies to YIVO. And on that basis, they were able to acquire a research collection for which they could work. But it was not a one-way street. These historians drew on what the people provided, as well as, of course, official archives. And they returned to the people their scholarship. They wrote not only for each other as historians, but they wrote for an educated lay readership. 
That was one of the most important characteristics of Yiddish scholarship, that it was not what the public refers to as scholarship in an ivory tower. The Yivo Letter, for example, were support, was, a, was a publication supported by subscription, and the readers were in Poland, Lithuania, United States, Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, all over the Yiddish-speaking Jewish world. And your, your prize for supporting the publication was, of course, that you would get the copy that says, here is your gift from Yivo. At Yivo's 10th anniversary conference in Vilna in 1935, the preeminent Jewish historian of that period, Simon Dubnov, contrasted the historians at YIVO with those in, in Palestine at the Hebrew University, which was also celebrating its 10th year of operations. And he said, comparing their two journals, he said, the difference is clear there, research for specialists, here for every thinking person, adding that the Jerusalem historian's work would be redeemed, as he put it, by popularizers who will make it accessible to the people. Today, the best known of the pre-war Yiddish historians is Emanuel Ringelblum, who I assume most of the people in this room would know as the creator of the Einig Shabbos project in the Warsaw Ghetto that, that organized 100 or more volunteers to collect documentation of Jewish life in the ghetto and beyond in all of occupied Europe, and which has been preserved at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and indexed and most recently cataloged. But the popular perception of the writing of Jewish history is that that was the end in Eastern Europe. If you asked anyone who knows the writing of Holocaust history as a general subject, and many even as specialists, they would say the accepted timeline of the writing of Holocaust history is that first, there were historians who wrote about the Holocaust from the perspective of what the Germans did to the Jews, what is called perpetrator history. The well-known Jewish historians, Leon Polyakov and Gerald Reitlinger, who published in the 1950s, followed by the still famous and landmark of them all historians, Raoul Hilberg, who published in 1961 the definitive history of what the Germans did, give the impression that that was the beginning of Holocaust research. And as Hilberg very famously said, quote, this is not a book about the Jews, it is a book about the people who destroyed the Jews. It is not surprising that so much research was done from the German perspective because, after all, there was a huge quantity of German documentary evidence that survived the war. And therefore, people could write authoritatively based on those documents. It is said in that same accepted timeline that only later did people turn to writing about Jewish experience only after the Eichmann trial, which brought out so many accusations of Jewish passivity and complicity in their own fate, only after the writings of Hannah Arendt and Bruno Bettelheim, as well as Raoul Hilbert, did people say that historians and the public began to look into what did the Jews actually do. And as it happens, that view completely overlooks the Yiddish historians. They began working even before the fighting ended. And the purpose of my work is to bring recognition to these historians in the context of Yiddish scholarship. After World War II, there were five survivors who became what I call the Yiddish historians of the Holocaust. Not more, not less. There were some you might call lay historians who did occasional scholarship. There were other historians who did a small part of their careers dealing with the Holocaust. But there were five specifically who devoted the remainder of their lives 
to writing about the Holocaust as professional historians, and did so to a significant degree in Yiddish, for the purpose of communicating their knowledge and their discoveries to the Yiddish-speaking public. They were all born between 1900 and 1907 in what was then the Pale of Settlement, and which later became independent Poland. Only one was born in what is today Poland. The rest were born, the others were born in the periphery, what is today either Belarus, Lithuania, or, or Ukraine, the portion of Galicia that became Ukraine. The first and most preeminent is Philip Friedman. He has rightly been called by his teacher, Salva Baron, the father of Holocaust history. He received his PhD at the University of Vienna, and he survived he survived the war years in hiding in his native city of Laval. He was protected by a Christian colleague, one of the rare few individuals who found refuge within the Christian colleague. Second, I would mention Isaiah Trunk. He was a young but distinguished historian before the war. He received his first degree at the University of Warsaw. And then after the war, when he came to the United States, he eventually received his doctorate at what was known as the Jewish Teachers Seminary and People's University in New York. It was the only institution that ever existed in this country that would grant a degree for a dissertation written in Yiddish or Hebrew. And he wrote a dissertation on the inner life of the Jews in the ghettos in Europe in Yiddish. He survived the war by fleeing into the Soviet Union where he was in a Soviet labor camp for the war years and made his way finally back to Poland after the liberation. Next, I would mention Mark Dvorzhetsky. He was a medical doctor before the war who practiced in film. But he was always very active in Jewish community affairs. He wrote in Yiddish and Hebrew before the war and was much published. After the war, he turned to writing history. He said, I dedicate my second life to telling what took place. And he received his PhD in history from the, from the Sorbonne. He survived, he had survived the Vilna Ghetto and seven concentration camps. And within three weeks of his liberation, he was in Paris writing Jewish history. He came to occupy the first chair of Holocaust studies in the world, which he created at Bar Ilan University, and which began to operate in the fall of 1959. Fourth, I would mention Yosef Kermish. He received his PhD at the University of Warsaw before the war. He too was hidden by a Christian colleague and he escaped into the Soviet Union and he came back as part of the Polish army that was sponsored by the Soviet Union to take over Poland. But what did he do in the army? He taught history in the army, army war college. And he came back first as a captain, and then you can see him, in fact, in the photo that you've all seen with the announcement of today's program. He is in his major's uniform, sitting in the Jewish Historical Institute. He became the director of archives, the founding director of archives at Yom Vashem. And last, I would mention Nachman Blumenthal, who was a Yiddish literary historian before the war, who received his first degree from the University of Warsaw, and was the only one of the Yiddish historians never to have a doctorate. But about half the time, he was referred to as Dr. Blumenthal in published locations, where his articles would appear, it was always Dr. Blumenthal, including even his obituary. He too survived by fleeing to the Soviet Union when the Nazis attacked from the West. Each of these historians lost their families and survived alone. Each one married a new wife after the war and had a new family. In, in the words of Mark Wojcicki, non-Jews returned to their families 
but Jews returned only to their people. And these men, as I would put it, also returned to their work. Jewish history, but of a new period. Friedman became the founding director of the Central Jewish Historical Commission in Poland. First in Lublin, and then in Lodz, as that city was liberated, and finally in Warsaw, as that city was liberated. He was joined there by Blumenthal, Kermisch, and Trump, and they all became colleagues and friends of Dworzecki's in different ways through the years. By 1950, they had all left Poland and Europe. Friedman and Trump came to America, Dworzecki, Kermisch, and Blumenthal went to Israel. And each remained in those places the rest of their lives. The subject of their work for the rest of their lives was the Holocaust in Poland broadly construed, and I say broadly because that would include all the historic areas that had ever been part of Poland, ranging from Lithuania to White Russia to Ukraine and including Poland as well. No Yiddish historian who left Europe before World War II turned to writing Holocaust history, and there were several quite well known, among them Raphael Mahler, Mark, 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 excuse me, Mark Vishnitzer, and several others whose names you might not recognize. They wrote Jewish history the rest of their careers, but not Holocaust history. And conversely, all of those who became Yiddish historians of the Holocaust were present in Europe, in Poland, when the Nazis attacked. I tell you that I am bringing you their work that has been neglected, but I don't want to suggest that they are unknown. These historians are not obscure. Trump, for example, won the National Book Award. When I said that to a colleague at UCLA, he said, you mean the National Jewish Book Award? And I said, well, yes, that twice, but in fact, the National Book Award. The first one ever given to a work in Jewish history for his book, Judenrat, on the Jewish councils. Dworzecki won the first Israel Prize in Jewish social science. That was in 1952. For his book on the Vilna Ghetto, his history of the Vilna Ghetto. And Karmish won the Katsetnik Prize from Yad Vashem. In fact, he shared it with Martin Gilbert, the very well-known British historian of the Holocaust. But in each of those cases, they were recognized for the works that had been translated out of Yiddish into other languages. Trunk wrote, wrote Judenrat only in Yiddish, but he published it in English. He had learned a lesson, an important one. In 1962, he wrote an exceptionally valuable work on the Lodge Ghetto, published only in Yiddish, and it remained completely obscure. It was, in fact, translated into English 25 years after his death and published in 2006. That is the extent to which Yiddish scholarship has remained valuable. But the lesson he learned was to publish in English. And so Judenrat appeared in 1972 only in English. The same with the other's works. Dvorzhetsky published his history of the Vilna Ghetto in Yiddish, but after it was translated into Hebrew, it won the Israel Prize. The same could be said for the other historians. What is overlooked among these historians is not only that they published in Yiddish, but that they were a group of historians together. Some are simply considered Israeli Holocaust historians. Others, Polish-American, but their closest bonds were actually with each other. They considered themselves each other's closest colleagues. And their works are united by a shared commitment to writing in Yiddish and to the research agenda that arose from the pre-war traditions of Yiddish historical scholarship that I have mentioned. 
in my work over the course of many, many years, I was able to assemble what I believe is virtually all of their writings which I would say number somewhere in the range of 500 works in Yiddish, ranging from whole books to a page or two essay. And I have had the pleasure and the honor of making those my, my leisure reading, so to speak. And they are magnificent historians. These are people who wrote with precision, with science, and with heart, and the art of combining those is what made them special. And Friedman commented on this. He said, you must be careful to separate the emotional aspect from the scholarly aspect, but they both, both must be there. And that's what he did in his works, and it's what each of them did. They were published in journals that I was able to dig up from everywhere in the world. Poland, the US, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, South Africa. They published in, in, in Yiddish journals in places you wouldn't have imagined. I was fortunate to be able to find their correspondence with one another. They wrote to each other almost exclusively in Yiddish, even though they all worked in a variety of settings. And I was able to chart their appearances together at conferences, appearances in journals together, and what you see is a network would be too large a word for five people, but what you see is a close-knit group who commented on each other's works, provided them help with each other in their, in their research tasks, supplied information, and updated each other over the course of years and years as to what they were working on. One of the most touching letters that I remember reading was when Philip Friedman was in his last few months. He, he died young of a variety of illnesses in New York. And his very good friend, Mark Dworzecki, who was just commencing to teach at bar Ilan University, wrote him a letter that said, Today was Philip Friedman hour. I brought your books to class, and I showed all the students everything you have written and told them all that I know, and I want you to know. And the truth is, we don't know if he did. The letter may or may not have arrived in time but it was the capstone to years of correspondence that we can look back at and understand how these historians interact with each other. Their commitment to Yiddish was enormous. It was never profitable to write in Yiddish. Dorozhetsky wrote to Friedman and asked his advice on how to get a particular book published in Yiddish. It had already appeared in Hebrew, but could he suggest a publisher in Yiddish? In the end, it was published by Yad Vashem, but Friedman had advice as well. Before the war, Blumenthal taught at a Jewish, a Polish Jewish gymnasium in Lublin, where his subject was Polish, teaching his students perfect pronunciation and grammar in Polish. And he said that he felt such guilt for doing this, for leaving them outside of Jewish studies, that he would teach Yiddish language and literature clandestinely in the evenings. But that at his school, Yiddish was forbidden because they wanted the students to perfect their Polish, that their accreditation, in fact, depended upon not speaking Polish with a Jewish accent. And so he was fired when it was discovered that he was teaching Yiddish. And the whole town and the whole press of the town rallied around him, and he was reinstated. And, ra and practically the same thing happened 20 years later at Yad Vashem. He was the one known for being the popularizer, the one who wanted to write for the people and who objected to their slow pace of work that had produced nothing for the people, and he was fired. And the survivor community in Israel rallied around him there again. The Yiddish press wrote in favor of him, and in fact, it was the director of Yad Vashem who ended up having to leave, and he was reinstated. <laughs> These are stories that one doesn't normally come across unless you come from a Yiddish perspective. And what they were interested in, as I've said, was to write about the Holocaust from the Jewish perspective. As 
As Friedman wrote in his words, delivered at a conference at Yad Vashem in 1957, what we need is a history of the Jewish people during the period of Nazi rule in which the central role is to be played by the Jewish people. Our approach must be definitely Judeo-centric as opposed to Nazi-centric. The notable characteristic of their works is a focus on Jewish life under Nazi occupation and the struggle to sustain it rather than on the forces that sought to extinguish it. Isaiah Trunk said, until the moment of final destruction, the ghetto existed, and he underlined existed, for two to three years. For us, the question of how the ghetto lived is no less important than the question of how it was murdered. Friedman emphasizes that, quote, within, and he underscores within, a Jewish life existed, exclamation mark. Whatever it was, the ghetto teemed with activities. There were constant changes and developments in its life, sudden metamorphoses and developments in the social and economic fabric. In their works, above all, it must be said that the Yiddish historians recreated the pre-war relationship that had existed between the historians and their Yiddish reading public. When Friedman returned to Lodge in March of 1945 as director of the Central Jewish Historical Commission, he published a notice. Dr. Philip Friedman has returned. Persons who possess memoirs, documents, photographs, or other materials about the Jewish destruction are invited to come, followed by his address and ours. A month later, in his first public report as director of the commission, he concluded with the appeal, every Jew is obligated to fulfill his historic duty, some by bearing witness, others by bringing documents or photographs, or by indicating where historical materials are located. And he stressed, therefore, without waiting until later, but immediately upon reading this article, you, Jewish reader, join with us and help with our great responsible work. We are waiting. The relationship of the historians with their public went as follows. First, they were concerned to bring to light the writings of those who were murdered. Friedman, Friedman wrote, for some, quote, the urge to record for eternal memory was literally as strong as the instinct to save one's life. And the Dvorzhetsky concluded, those who disappeared have commanded us, tell. The historians became, in a sense, the literary executors of the murdered authors. And I mean in the most definite sense, the literary executors. They prepared for publication every manuscript, every document that they could find over the course of their careers to make known, to make public, what those who were murdered had written. Second, they interviewed survivors. They collected eyewitness accounts. This was their major activity in Poland and again in the U.S. and in Israel. It was Dworzhetsky's radical departure from what was considered good scholarship that he had his students interview Holocaust survivors. Other historians thought that perhaps this was unprofessional, that one didn't do this. And of course, today, we know that that has become the obligatory norm before the time runs out to interview Holocaust survivors because that, as Philip Friedman put it, is the living proof of the historical process. In their very flesh, these people bear witness, as he put it. In addition, they supported the publishing of eyewitness accounts, not only the recording of them, but the publishing of them. And they lent their names to these accounts. Dozens of memoirs and first-person accounts were published with introductions by Yiddish historians. And the introduction would very often focus on some aspect of the person's story that was a particular research interest to that given historian. For example, Blumenthal dwelt particularly on 
the chances for survival if one could get to the Aryan side, to the non-Jewish side. And that was a feature of the particular oral, oral account that he, was, that he was introducing. The works of the Yiddish historians arose as part of the struggle by Jews under Nazi occupation to transmit a record of their experiences to their fellow Jews an impulse for self-expression that continued to animate the surviving remnant, as they were called. In their earliest writings, the Yiddish historians recognized what they considered an urge to record for eternal memory, as they put it, among the Jews of captivity, and a mighty folk movement, as Friedman put it, for self-expression among the survivors. By 1950, for example, Friedman reported on the publication of more than 10,000 books and articles, which he said is already a whole literature. And paraphrasing Ezekiel, he said, all have become prophets, all have encountered God's burning fire and have brought speech to their mute lips. For those reasons, the Yiddish historians helped by, getting, by giving their names to these accounts themselves. In addition, they formed what I have I prefer to call a lay professional partnership, a partnership with the survivors, by which they encouraged, promoted, and then drew upon the survivors' works of self-expression. All of these they used in their works as the basis of information, in the absence of other documents. For example, in Trost Judenrat, his research notes that I read myself at Yad Vashem, pardon me, at, at YIVO in New York, reveal the array of supporting materials from Yisker books, personal accounts, and questionnaires to every source that he could find. In all, he collected materials on the Jewish councils of 405 Jewish locations. His major research tool was a confidential questionnaire of ghetto survivors on the backgrounds and behavior of Judenrat members and ghetto policemen. He collected 927 completed questionnaires, which remain sealed in the Yivo archives to protect their anonymity. Similarly, Dvorzhetsky, in his history of the, uh, of the labor camps in Estonia, in which he also was incarcerated, his title was Weisse Nacht und Schwarze Tag, White Nights and Black Days. In that history, he drew upon 137 eyewitness accounts that he incorporated into his history writing. They described the victims and the survivors' works of self-expression as links in the continuing golden chain, the golden decade of Jewish history, literary creativity, and they undertook, as they put it, to extend further the golden chain by transmitting the essential content of these works to future generations through their historical writing. The general memorial impulse that inspired survivors to speak also served as a catalyst for the Yiddish historians on work. Kermish observes that, quote, the great cataclysm penetrated deeply into the mood and feeling of our people, and it impels us to record, to describe, to revivify that which so tragically disappeared. Isaiah Trunk's turn to Holocaust history was explained to me by his son, Gabi, who said, in the absence of his mother's, pardon me, in the absence of his mother and sisters in their Treblinka fate, he owed it to them and all the others to eternalize what had happened in the writing of that sacrosanct historiographic epic he was capable of and trained for. These historians deliberately wrote for an audience of survivors to make available their research. One way that they did so was to participate in the writing of the Yisker Bicha, the memorial books. As you know, many, many towns and the survivors of towns produced memorial books about their towns. They are often described as important sources of historical information, but not really historical writing lacking in historical precision and depth. But that is only because there were so few surviving historians. In fact, the Yisker Bicher editors made use of the Yiddish historians to the fullest extent that they could. 
I have identified 37 such books with 70 contributions from Yiddish historians. And that's only the living Yiddish historians. Because for many towns, there were accounts of their history from the pre-war period that had been written by historians who did not survive. And those, too, were incorporated into many Yisker books. The respect with which the historians were regarded is indicated by the fact that their accounts in the books where they do occur are almost always placed at either the very beginning of the book or the beginning of the section dealing with the show. These historians, the Yiddish historians, were public figures in the Yiddish field, in the Yiddish arena. The respect for historians in the Yiddish-speaking world cannot be understood in the American context. In Eastern Europe and Yiddish circles in particular, historians were at the peak of the intellectual pyramid. When Philip Friedman corrected an error in a, in a I won't call it a newspaper, but a, a Yiddish journal in Israel, he, he wrote to the editor to have something corrected that he found had been said wrong. The editor did not bury that comment, as one usually sees done, but instead he put it at the top of a page with a headline that read, A Correction from Historian Dr. Philip Friedman. This was an honor to his publication to have the historian write to them. These historians were frequent speakers at public events in Yiddish, in the U.S., in Canada, in Israel. They were often on radio and later on television. We are fortunate that, in fact, Vivo has preserved radio talks by two of them, by Isaiah Trunk and by Nachman Blumenthal, that can be heard online, downloaded. They are 15 minutes each, talking about topics in Holocaust history from their research. And it is quite, quite moving to hear them in their own words and in their own voices. The respect given to these historians was such that a young cousin of Friedman recounted recently that he said, I recall meeting him on several occasions as a child. Out of respect, we always called him Dr. Friedman. In their use of language, the Yiddish historians shared the survivors' anger at the Germans. They wrote things you couldn't write in English. They used modes of expression that would seem overblown, but in Yiddish were the norm. They used such expressions as Nazi Rotsky, the Nazi murderers, Nazi Kalyan, the Nazi hangman, and Hitler's Treifen and Moil, out of Hitler's unclean mouth. These are widespread, if not terribly frequent, in their otherwise unemotional writings. They share the survivors' expressions of irony or scorn, as in Blumenthal's statement that German officials were carrying out their Rebbe's Torah, their rabbi's Torah, to indicate Hitler's commands. They gave new meaning to metaphors from the shared tradition, as in Friedman's use of the term Torah Shabalpet, the oral, the oral law, the traditional term for the religious oral law oral law, which he gave to honor the new phenomenon of oral testimony. Let me share with you the topics that they wrote about most, that they researched and investigated. They were interested in the Jewish councils, the Judenrat, their composition, degree of continuity from prior Jewish leaderships, extent of popular legitimacy their untenable position as both the servant of the Nazis and the master of the Jews, their strategies for survival or lack thereof, their humility or their messianic aspirations, as Friedman put it. Trunk specifically condemned what he called the Judenrat mentality, when leaders crossed the line from helping to keep Jews alive to selecting those who would be kept and others who would be sent away. They wrote about political groups, the continuity of pre-war political parties, because that was the organizing force for all activities, even in the ghetto. We don't understand it here in America today, but Jewish life in pre-war Europe was organized along party lines. Your friends were in your party. 
you married within your party. That was your social circle. And all the activities that one might organize were in that vein. They wrote about parties as underground, as, as putting forth underground political activity and publications, cooperation and conflict among the parties, shift in the balance of power between young, between young activists and the official leaderships under changing conditions, and the moral preparation for resistance. Trump, who was a lifelong member of the Bund, the Jewish Workers' Party, praised the social welfare work organized by Bund members of a Judenrat. Karamish argued that the psychological readiness for revolt, as he put it, among various political groups in the ghetto could be traced to each group's pre-war structure. They were also interested in social differentiation and class conflict in the ghetto, the things they might have written about before the war. The continuities and ruptures in pre-war class structure, rapidly changing lines of definition, declassification, pauperization, what Friedman called pseudo-proletarianization, the rise of a, a criminal class that he described as the lumpen bourgeoisie, and the effects on chances for survival. They wrote about armed resistance and all the conditions that made it possible or impossible, and they wrote about unarmed resistance. All of their topics were interconnected, and that's what makes the research both fascinating and difficult. We can find examples in their writings that intertwine with every possible subject. I will give you just one as an example. The wide-ranging nature of their research can be seen in the topic of food. It was the duty of a Judenrat to ensure the provisioning of the ghetto. But how did this affect their relations with the unofficial, independent self-help groups that organized themselves within the ghetto and became rival sources of power? The Yiddish historians studied the taxes on food and the broader issue of the inequity in the sharing of economic burdens. In the Warsaw Ghetto, for example, the Judenrat was said to side with those of wealth. They did not tax income or assets, they taxed only consumption. As Kermish put it, there is no government in Europe that would not be ashamed to construct its budget on the basis of consumption taxes because it taxed only the poor. There was the problem of starvation as a pervasive factor in daily life, which also led to a new field for medical research among Jewish doctors in the Warsaw Ghetto. And their research is still consulted. There was the imperative for smuggling food from outside the ghettos, manifested as personal heroism and resistance, especially among mothers and children or among other individuals as a source of profiteering and speculation, by contrast. And one can look at them in either way. There was the status of food sufficiency or insufficiency as the new and perhaps only determinant of economic class and chance for survival in the ghettos. And there was the starvation rations allotted in the camps, combated at times by the forming of cooperative groups to guard and prepare the results of illicit scavenging all of which are the subjects of various studies by the Yiddish historians. And that is to speak of only one aspect of their work, one of the smallest aspects. But what I discovered was that they did not write general histories. Not one contemplated or attempted to write a grand synthesis or to draw together the perpetrators, the victims, the bystanders, and all locations into one story. If they had, they would likely have been similar in their form to the second portion of Lucy Davidovich's The War Against the Jews, in which she writes about Jewish experience, and she quotes substantially from all five of what I call my Yiddish historians. Instead, they dealt with particular locations or specific issues. I believe, myself, that it might have proved unrewarding to write a grand history. Whatever satisfaction they may have found in their work, and whatever solace, I believe came largely from staying close to their material. 
close to their murdered fellow Jews and to their fellow survivors by giving voice to their experiences. Blumenthal commented on the slow pace with which the editors of a Yisker book would work, that they took many more years to produce than you could explain. And he said, we do not want to tear away from that past that is so dear to us. One wants still to live in that former world with those people, with those problems, and with oneself from that time. And above all, there was one issue that particularly troubled the Yiddish historians and their fellow survivors. Before the war, the Yiddish historians had a tradition of what is called an engaged scholarship. They helped to create weapons in the fight for Jewish rights. After the war, they needed to provide answers for a new problem, and that was an internal Jewish one. They encountered the single issue that would occupy the rest of their collective consciousness, that would occupy their collective consciences, consciences for the remainder of their careers. The accusation that the Jewish victims of the Holocaust had allowed themselves to be murdered without resisting. For the Yiddish historians, the problem of resistance and passivity was the question of all questions. Friedman asks, why did the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising come only in April 1943, when more than 350,000 Jews in Warsaw had already been murdered? Trunk says, the question can be formulated briefly thus, why did resistance come so late and therefore so weak, and why did the Jewish masses go so passively to their deaths? In 1945, Blumenthal voiced the feeling of many survivors, saying, when you consider the problem of defense, you burn with the hellfire of the feeling of shame. Why did the Jews themselves not mount a defense but let themselves be led to their deaths like cowardly sheep? He himself replied, are sheep not a symbol of purity and innocence? And when slaughterers led the sheep into the slaughterhouse, are the slaughterers or the sheep with them? The Yiddish historians created created an audacious defense against this accusation, and that was in the field discussing spiritual resistance, unarmed resistance. Dworzhetsky was the historian principally responsible. He wrote an essay in 1946 titled, Farshidens and Ingevein Varied Were the Ways. First, he praises all forms of active resistance, but then continues, do we not commit a great wrong against our murdered fathers and mothers, brothers and wives, when we speak only of the active armed fight in the ghettos? And we do not recount the other means of Jewish struggle. He then writes about the varied forms of resistance observed by him in the Vilna ghetto. He talks about building an underground city of bunkers, about the life-threatening task of smuggling in food, about the inventiveness of providing heat and building materials and tools and cleanser, about the Jewish doctors and nurses who, without implements or medications, prevented and stopped epidemics, about the teachers who created schools and devoted themselves to their children, the rabbis who struggled to continue religious observance. With respect to each of these forms of resistance, Dvorzhetsky invoked the judgment of history, he asked, on the one hand, will the future historian regard the building of bunkers as how the Jews ran away from the fight? Or in smuggling food, in the time of their fateful murder, they risked their lives for bread and not for honor? And he asked, is it madness to write poems and put on theater and teach children when facing death? But then on the other hand, he said, to each of these he imagines, quote, a quiet request to the Jewish writer of history from all of those who struggled, namely, on the day when you seal the book of Jewish resistance, ask yourself whether in our deeds there also lies resistance to the Germans' murderous intent. Over the course of the following decades, Dvorzhetsky expanded his work on this subject, and his view was gradually adopted and promoted by each of the Yiddish historians. After his death, Trump wrote, in the broader meaning of the notion of resistance, including cultural, religious, economic, sanitary, and political resistance, Jews in the ghettos, and to some extent in the camps, 
were defying and resisting the oppressors almost constantly. As the late Mark Rojetsky put it, the sole fact of staying alive longer than the Germans' calculations predicted was an act of resistance. Today, we might say that the great majority of survivors could not have remained alive to the time of escape or liberation without these means of unarmed resistance. Dorzhetsky's view has been adopted by the academic community, at least. In the article, Spiritual Resistance in the Ghettos and Concentration Camps, newly written for the 2007 edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica by Michael Berenbaum, our host today. He writes that education and religion, underground publications, self-help kitchens, humor, creative culture, cultural creativity, and efforts to build a historical record were what constituted the Jews' possibilities for resistance. These views have lately been, been adopted and promoted by Yad Vashem, by the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and have shaped what in the scholarly community is the understanding of Jewish resistance. All of which brings us to the question of what meaning we should take from the Yiddish historians' works, including resistance and every other topic on which they wrote. Clearly, their way of coping with the catastrophe was that they chose to write about Jewish life rather than Jewish death. I would suggest that in reading their works, we find the opportunity to do the same. Need to leave and have told me so and have gone, but I will remain for a short time. You want to take questions? If you like, that's up to you. If you feel okay. we have time and people well, have time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's have questions. Uh, let me only send one. I'm going to let Mark field the questions easily. Let me only send one ground rule. You've heard of an absolutely brilliant lecture. We don't need a second. <laughs> so ask your, ask, ask, your, ask, your, ask your questions, but if you're going to give a lecture, we're going to invite you back another time. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for a most fascinating and instructive uh, talk. I'm honored to have such an attentive audience. Do you, can you uh, estimate what percentage of the works still remain untranslated? I would say 95%. Some of the major works have been translated, but I would say that the vast majority have not. If you, if you would like to see my dissertation, you will find that I have prepared what I consider a fairly comprehensive bibliography of all of their writings. And in each instance, I give the complete publication history and translation history. We are fortunate that some of their histories that were written as chapters for a history book have been translated online into English. What were the most obscure writings, namely the history books in Yiddish, have become the most accessible Yiddish writings of all, because the history books at the Jewish Genealogy website are translated again and again, more keep appearing. And I'm constantly surprised and pleased to see my historians' works appear in English. So in that sense, there is some. But their most personal writings, and in fact, their earliest writings, which are their most important, because they are the freshest, the ones that Philip Friedman wrote about how to write Holocaust history. None of those have been translated, and, and ought to be. Uh, as a translator of some of the Yiska books that are online, I have found that there is a great deal of mistranslation. Yes, there is. Either through ignorance or through uh, a uh, particular point of view that doesn't agree with the writers. To what extent will academics such as yourself exercise some rigorous control over the so-called history that's being published online? Mark Swan died. 
<laughs> right, I'm sorry to say that it's not possible to exercise control over such things, but one can, I suppose, propose correctives. Uh, my task is somewhat different. It is to tell their words in their own words, and you will find in my work a great deal of translation and quotation. I should say, um, one of these days, I hope there will be a book published. It's very rare to talk about a dissertation before the book. But the dissertation is available online if you want to see it. If you Google search my name, put in quotes, Mark Smith, and then put in quotes after it, Yiddish historians, it will pop up. And it does it without the quotes. <laughs> Even without the quotes. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you for your informative lecture. I was wondering if you would share with us some of the surprises you discovered in the reading. Some of the things you weren't expecting to find that gave you new insights. Not all. Sure. <laughs> the best way to answer that question is, and first of all, could everyone hear the question? Yes. I assume you could. I um, One of the most important things about the Yiddish historians' works is that they they preview what later historians find of interest. At one time, no one studied what the Jews went through during the Holocaust. Today, everyone studies this. But what are the topics of interest? One of them, for example, is the position of women during the Holocaust. And both Dvorzhetsky and Karamish wrote at length separate essays on the subject of the role of women at a time when no one was writing about women. In the 1940s, they talked about the Yiddish Jewish women couriers who went from town to town secretly carrying messages and, and, and money and other things that needed to be transported. It was very, very dangerous work. But these were primarily women. And they wrote about the role of women in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and in other acts of resistance, quite remarkably. And you wouldn't expect that from that era. And most of all, those who think they've discovered the subject today need to know that they have not newly discovered it, that there were those who gave appreciation to this sort of thing. Yes? Are any of these books available to the Yiddish book center? Yes. Um, about, yes, there, there is at least one book by each of these historians available through the Yiddish Book Center, online for free. A lot of their writings are in journals, and the journals are not. But, um, yes, Trunks, well, that I have to say is not true. Trunks Lodge Ghetto is not available online. I don't know why exactly, but you can buy it in English and read it in English. It's a wonderful book. Judenrat, likewise, is in English. But if you want Trunks history of the slave labor camps in the annexed area of Poland that he published in 1949, that is available at the Yiddish Book Center. And you have to be very careful with Trump because he had a cousin of the same name, Yud Yud Trump, who was a famous literary critic. And you have to make sure whether you're looking at Yeshaya Trump or Yud Yud Trump. But you will find it. Um, Karamish's history of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was published in Yiddish. That's available. One of the most important works is actually not. And it's a shame, but I will tell you about it briefly because it's worth knowing. It's called Werther und Werthlich, Words and Sayings, by Blumenthal. He spent 30, 35 years collecting the language of the time, what people said, the words they used. He said, when I came back to my town, I didn't understand what people were talking about. They used new, new words about experiences I didn't know. And he spent to the last of his career and published as his last work a monumental volume that has been recognized by everyone from David Roskies to you name it as one of the standard works in the field. I'll quote you one saying only from it. Says one old Jew to another, it is true that I will not survive and that you will not survive, but we are comforted by the fact that we will survive. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you say it in Yiddish? I wouldn't want to misquote it. I could, but I, I would have to have it direct, 
correctly, then I wouldn't want to be recorded misquoting it. <laughs> um, but I, I certainly have it. Yes. Um, saw something online about a female woman historian, Rachel Auerbach. Oh, yes. Well, Rachel Auerbach is a very important figure. She was a colleague of all of my historians. She was not, however, a historian. And she was a journalist. She was in charge of the oral history collecting process at the Central Jewish Historical Commission in Poland immediately after the war, and then at Yad Vashem. She's of great interest and great importance. Alas, she is not a historian. That is to say, she took oral histories, she sometimes wrote interpretive essays, but she did not do the historian's work, which is to take material from the past and put your own thought into organizing it and presenting it. Um, I should, as an aside, say that it is both by chance and a sign of the times that all of my historians are men. By chance, because there were women before the war who, if they had survived, would have been Yiddish historians of the Holocaust. One who comes to mind is Bella Mandelsberg. She wrote extensively in Yiddish before the war, and in fact, Blumenthal published a book of translations into Hebrew of her works after the war. There were others who could have been Yiddish historians of the Holocaust, but who chose instead instead to subsume their careers to those of their husbands. An example is Philip Friedman's post-war wife, Ada Abram. She had a doctorate in history from the University of Laval, but after their marriage, she assisted with his work and completed some of his projects after his death. And interestingly enough, even on those, she's listed as an author as Mrs. Philip Friedman. <laughs> So, um, first of all, I just want to thank you for this distillation of this multifaceted, amazing dissertation. Which cannot be done, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I have a question which might be too complex, I don't know. Um, so you mentioned Trunk's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, discovery tome about the Judenrat, yeah? Yes. Do you know how his his uh, conclusion about them might jive with, let's say, what Hannah Arendt wrote oh, well, later? He was, he was a decided intellectual enemy of Hannah Arendt's. Mm. He intellectual enemy. En enemy. And he, he deliberately and directly wrote in opposition to her. He said that her writings could only come from a total ignorance of Jewish history. Yeah. <laughs> and the only thing I would want to say in this regard is that it has often been said that his book was written as a response to Hannah Arendt, that he took up an interest in the Jewish councils because of her. There is one percent of truth in this. He certainly was responding to her accusations, but he began writing about the Jewish councils in 1949, and he published book, well, I shouldn't say book, but article after article in which he dealt with the Jewish councils, and so did Philip Friedman until his death in 1960, long before Hannah Arendt wrote any. Mm -hmm. But, but the, int the interest in bringing his book to the English language yes, that. was produced in response to Hannah Arendt. Yes. And, there is to no his and to his credit, Hilberg gave it an absolutely um, enthusiastic review uh, for someone who didn't deal with Jewish sources. Yes, yes, it is absolutely true. I don't know if everyone would hear what Michael said in the back, but Hilberg, who did not necessarily agree with Trump on many matters, nonetheless saw to helping to get published the Judenrat volume and reviewed it very enthusiastically. And yes, in English. And despite his not being a Jewish historian, indeed, but rather a political scientist. I, I should mention that Philip Friedman was on Raoul Hilberg's doctoral committee at Columbia, and Philip Friedman recommended to Yad Vashem that they should publish Hilberg's work. And Yad Vashem refused. They considered it anti-Jewish. The things that Hilberg said about Jews and about their not resisting, as he, as he felt, uh, rendered it a work they didn't wish to publish. But Friedman himself was broad-minded. But a half century later, they did. 
Pardon? A half century? Yes, a half century later, they did finally publish it, yes. <laughs> um, yes, I'll start over here. My mother, uh, during the 60s and 70s, would write Peter Goodman letters to, for reparations paintings. Yes. Peter Goodman. Has any historian ever gone over and met with some of the lawyers in Germany that were representing these people and studied uh, the uh, accounts? Because they would spend sometimes two, three hours that my mother would type up their accounts. That's a very interesting question. And when you say accounts, you don't mean what everyone thinks about first, which is the mismanagement of the funds, but rather the oral <laughs> accounts that are given. And yeah. the answer is no, not that I'm aware of, and it would be a fascinating subject, because indeed that's another source of oral testimony. Those who gave lawyers their oral account of what took place I have, for the reparations. I have a response to that. There is a book written about the man who survived Auschwitz, I believe, who ripped off many, many survivors and was prosecuted by a, an attorney who worked for the federal prosecutor's office who put the guy away, and then the guy somehow, through an error, a clerical error, sat on the street again about a decade later. He's probably since died. I can't remember the name of the book, but you can Google this story to find out. So, yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much for your discussion. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, so one way historians influence the field is that other historians use them or take their insights or their findings or everything they put together. You already mentioned Lucy Davidovich using some of this for her terrific book. Were they used by others or not? Yes. That's a fascinating question. Because if I had finished my dissertation two or three years or even five years sooner, which could have been done, I would have missed an important fact. Up until that time, the only way you could read these historians' works would be in translation, if you were lucky, if you didn't read Yiddish. But something remarkable has happened in the last, well, even 10 years, and it has increased. And that is, among young scholars, there has been a return to original languages, not only Yiddish, but particularly including Yiddish, in which when I read the new books that are most recently published about Jewish life during the Holocaust by young Jewish scholars both in Israel and in Eastern Europe and non-Jewish ones as well, I am amazed to find that for the first time they are citing from the Yiddish sources and they're doing it left and right. Absolutely amazing. I, I, I discuss, in fact, in my final chapter about half a dozen of them who are doing exactly that. Prior to that, I would say, yes, there are some who are widely cited, and others much less. But now it has turned an interesting point. When should I call time? Uh, I'm going to do something very unusual, which we always do here, which is we will ask all of you who, who have questions to raise your hands. We will take all the questions. If you have a pen, you'll write, write, you'll write, your team. A, write, a, write a brief <laughs> note, and Mark will give you one answer. Fine. Incorporating everything. So let's start in this oh quadrant. <laughs> it, no, it, it works. I, I see one, two hands, and in this quadrant, what do we have? So we have two questions, three questions remaining. Uh -huh. Five questions, okay, one. I'm particularly, or was particularly interested in your words, anti the chromis mode? Uh, Anti-lacrimose. Lacrimose mode, thank you. Yes, and uh, my question isn't what it means, but what it means, and why. And why is that prohibited <coughs> in a matter that contains so much emotion? I, I will be happy to answer that. Yes, sir. In the flood of questions I have, I will just pick one. <laughs> At what point? Did the survivors' Yiddish term Chobun become jettisoned in favor of Holocaust and Shoah? Third question. I would like to know about partisans. Okay. And the questions on this quadrant? Please. Did you have questions? What in, yes. 
what in particular made you get into this subject? Okay, and is there one more question, please? You mentioned the correspondence of the five historians. Um, they wrote to each other. Where are where is that correspondence? Primarily at Evo and some of the show. There's another question here. Okay, please. Well, that said that American Jews don't understand that Eastern European Jews, that their life was divided into parties. Trump was head of the uh, Buddhists. Who were the other four? Okay. Five. Mark? Five. I will tell you that the first time I saw this technique used was in 1974, when Elie Wiesel spoke at a synagogue here in Los Angeles. And the only way he took questions was to say, I will take 10 questions, and then I will answer in one answer. And I thought, what an unusual manner. I didn't know it would be mine. Um, the the matter of the anti-lachrymose view of Jewish history. Salo Baron, a great Jewish historian of the early and middle part of the 20th century, felt that too much emphasis was placed on suffering in the study of Jewish history. He said it's simply not so. These were exceptional episodes throughout all of Jewish history. In most of Jewish history, Jews got along reasonably well with their non-Jewish neighbors and didn't suffer, and in fact created important elements of civilization and were integrated into, into society in ways that are not recognized, and that if we simply discuss calamities and pogroms and crusades, we don't really know Jewish history. He is credited with being the first to have such an idea. It happens to be not so. He came from the same place as most of my, my Yiddish historians. Galician. If he had stayed there, he would have been a colleague of Philip Friedman, who was a student of his, and a colleague of Karamish and Blumenthal and others, not to mention Raphael Mahler and, uh, and, and probably Blumenthal himself. They all, for a generation before that, and their predecessors, had been practicing a view of Jewish history that was one, as Michael put it, of Jewish agency, Jewish self-determination interest in what Jews determined for themselves. Isaiah Trunk even criticized an article by his colleague Raphael Mahler, saying, Mahler dwells too heavily on the negative. I believe these were only isolated incidents. He should dwell more on the positive. If they had been of the other sort, the type who write Jewish history about calamity only, it would have incapacitated them to write Holocaust history. They could only have written perpetrator history. They could only have written body counts. They could never have written about Jewish life because it would not have been their interest. It would not have been what they were already, to use the Yiddish term, bahadant, anchored, educated, founded in. And it was the fortunate coincidence that they came from a tradition that valued the study of Jewish existence in all its forms that led them to be Jewish historians of the Holocaust rather than German historians. There's a much larger subject under what you've asked, but that's the shortest answer I can give. As to the terminology, Horbun is the term that the Yiddish historians used. It's from the Hebrew word meaning catastrophe. It usually refers to the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem. They never used any other term, except possibly catastrophe in Yiddish. Those who lived the longest and the latest would have known the terms Shoah and Holocaust, but they would never have used those terms in Yiddish. They would, of course, have used them in writing in English or in Hebrew simply because they are in those languages. So I cannot answer you to say they ever abandoned the term for them. They did not. For the ease of my presentation and my writing, and I explain this in my dissertation, I use the word Holocaust simply for uniformity and to avoid the complexity of constant explanation. <laughs>
as to the subject of partisans. My historians did not write a great deal about the partisans. For the reason that they were urban dwellers themselves, I suppose, and they related to urban dwellers, and there wasn't a lot of documentary material produced outside of urban areas. There were also not a huge number of survivors who had been partisans to interview. They did value this greatly, and they wrote to some extent about the impediments to joining the partisans, the degree to which certain Polish groups would not accept Jewish partisans, the, the dangers of trying to be Jewish and, and adhere to a partisan group, because it would bring danger to the partisan group as well. But this was not one of their major subjects, I'm sorry to say. The other parties to which the Yiddish historians belonged, indeed, Trump had been a Zionist in his youth, but became a Bundist later, which is to say an anti-Zionist. But late in life, shortly before his sudden death, he had already resolved to retire from Evo, where he was the director of the archives, to go to Israel, settle there, and assume a professorship and an editorship of a publication, you know, in, and not in Holocaust studies, but in Jewish, in Jewish history. So he was also fluid. Philip Friedman was a left-center, but by no means far-left Zionist and socialist. Kermish was the same. Blumenthal was outspokenly nonpartisan. He wrote all his life in the Yiddish papers published by the Bund, but declared right there, I am not a Bundist, and I have never been a Bundist. But they recreated for him the Hamish Yiddish world that he knew. They were the only party in Israel that actually valued Yiddish and Yiddish language. Dvorzhetsky had the most complicated relationship with Yiddish. He wrote in both Yiddish and Hebrew from childhood. He graduated from a Hebrew gymnasium. He was an anti-Yiddishist in his youth in Vilna. He wrote an article called Yiddishism, or something like that, in the dock, and it was an account of a mock trial of the Yiddishists for being what they considered anti-Zionist and anti-national. But at the same time, he wrote all his life in Yiddish, sought to make sure that every one of his works was published in Yiddish, and he, he never negated that part of his background. And as I say, he wrote all his letters in Yiddish to the Yiddish historians. I found it a bit perplexing, actually, because he himself was so fluid in his attitudes. He was a socialist Zionist. He, as a medical doctor, also in Israel, he was part of the National Health Service, and he wrote about socialized medicine and its importance for the Jewish people in Israel. I think that's the best I can cover their political affiliations, except to add that in their writings about the Holocaust, they always found a way to emphasize the activities of the people with whom they identified. Dworzhetsky was of the right Polizioni party, that is to say, the right wing of the far left, <laughs> and that's who he wrote about with special emphasis in his history of the Vilna Ghetto. Trump talked about the achievements of the Bund in various towns that he would write about. He said only the Bundists on the Jewish Council were concerned with Jewish welfare, and they really worked hard to see that people were clothed and fed. Each of them in their own ways tried to give justice to the stream of Jewish politics with which they identified. And then last you asked, why me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Why does a subject grab you? Early in my studies, I was interested in the Yiddish historians. I still am, as a phenomenon overall. Clearly, the topic of their Holocaust studies is really book two. Book one is what did the Yiddish historians do before the Holocaust? Someday I may write that book. You don't know. But. It became clear in the course of my work that the more urgent story 
that needed to be told now was of the Holocaust period. Very early on, one of my professors asked me, so are you interested in the Holocaust period? I said, absolutely not. And yet it became my subject. And it has been It has been an enormous experience because it brings you into contact with absolutely everything. That's it, folks. Thank you. Let me first of all uh, thank more. Dr. Morrison for one of the most um, important lectures that I've heard at this university.